morning, everyone. Welcome on this Sunday, the 27th of December. These are the Sundays of Christmas. We celebrate the central truth of the Word made flesh for our salvation. And in these days, we also remember the saints of old. Stephen, who was the first to be martyred for his faith in the incarnate Word. And today we remember John the Apostle, the writer of the Gospel who lived till old age in profound meditation upon the Word made flesh, whose closing days included days of persecution and exile upon Patmos, a man, it is said, that when he could barely able to speak to churches when he was so old, he would say, love one another. So let's be still at the start of our act of worship this morning. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. People of God, shout and sing. Tell the good news of peace on earth. Lord, bring us today into Christ's peace. All God's people say, Amen. Angels dance and the bright star shines. All creation bows to the Lord of all. Lord, bring us today into Christ's light. All God's people say, Amen. One with us, yet born to save, he will show us the way to God. Lord, bring us today into Christ's love. All God's people say, Amen. People of God, shout and sing, Alleluia, Alleluia, Amen. We sing together our opening carol. We've come together, the people of God, drawn by His Spirit, longing for His Word, to praise the holy name of the Lord, to share His glorious news of grace, to pray for our needs and the pain of the world, to rejoice in His love and be sent in His peace. At this time we celebrate Christ, the light of the world, who came into our world, and we remember, as we approach our prayers of penitence, that Christ has come to dispel the darkness of our hearts. In His light, Let us examine ourselves and confess our sins. Let's be still for a few moments. Lord of grace and truth, we confess our unworthiness to stand in your presence as your children. We have sinned. Forgive and heal us. The Virgin Mary accepted your call to be the mother of Jesus. 
Forgive our disobedience to your will. We have sinned. Forgive and heal us. Your Son, our Saviour, was born in poverty in a manger. Forgive our greed and rejection of your ways. We have sinned. Forgive and heal us. The shepherds left their flocks to go to Bethlehem. Forgive our self-interest and lack of vision. We have sinned. Forgive and heal us. The wise men followed the star to find Jesus the King. Forgive our reluctance to seek you. We have sinned. Forgive and heal us. May God, who loved the world so much that he sent his son Jesus to be our saviour, forgive you your sins and make you holy to serve him in his world. Amen. Blessed is the Lord, for he has heard the voice of our prayer. Therefore shall our hearts dance for joy, and in our song will we praise our God. We say together the Gloria. Glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High Jesus Christ with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The night has passed and the day lies open before us, so let us now pray in silence with one heart and mind. As we rejoice in the gift of this new day, so may the light of your presence, O God, set our hearts on fire with love for you, now and forever. Amen. As we come to the Word of God, we listen to Psalm 117, a short psalm with a huge vision. Praise the Lord, all you nations. Extol him, all you peoples. For great is his love towards us, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Let's listen to our Old Testament reading now from Exodus. The first reading is taken from the book of Exodus, chapter 33, beginning at verse 7 until 11. Moses took his tent and pitched it outside the camp, far from the camp, and called it the Tabernacle of Meeting. And it came to pass that everyone who sought the Lord went out to the Tabernacle of Meeting, which was outside the camp. So it was, whenever Moses went out to the Tabernacle, that all the people rose. And each man stood at his tent door and watched Moses until he had gone into the tabernacle. And it came to, came to pass, when Moses entered the tabernacle, that the pillar of cloud descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle. And the Lord talked with Moses. All the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the tabernacle door, and all the people rose and worshipped, each man in his tent door. So the Lord spoke to Moses face to face, and as a man speaks to his friend, and he would return to the camp. But his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, did not depart from the tabernacle. This is the word of the Lord.
We listen to our next scripture reading from 1 John chapter 1. The second reading is taken out of the first epistle of John, chapter 1. That which, which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled, concerning the word of life, the life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us, that which we have seen and heard, we declare to you, that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you, that your joy may be full. This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. This is the word of the Lord. And so we hear our third reading, our gospel reading from John chapter 21 at verse 19. Glory to you, O Lord. After this, he, Jesus, said to him, that is Peter, follow me. Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them. He was the one who had reclined next to Jesus at the supper and had said, Lord, who is it that is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about him? Jesus said to him, If it is my will that he remain until I come, what is it to you? Follow me. So the rumor spread in the community that this disciple would not die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he would not die. But if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? This is the disciple who is testifying to these things and has written them, and we know that his testimony is true. But there are also many other things that Jesus did. If every one of them were written down, 
I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We say during this Christmas season, uh, the Canticle of the Chosen One, words based on Isaiah 11. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. There shall come forth a shoot from the stalk of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb and the leopard shall lie down with the goat the calf, the lion, and the fatling together, with a little child to lead them. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord, as the waters cover the sea. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. For our sermon this morning, we welcome again uh, Yap Taunus, uh, who will preach. Uh, Yap is an Anglican reader within the Netherlands Deanery, and we welcome him this morning. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts and minds be now and always acceptable to thee, O God, our strength and our Redeemer. On this last Sunday and in this last week of the year, we usually look back as well as forward. This time, in all honesty, I'm probably just like you, at a loss for words when it comes to the past year. Even though we live in a relatively rich and free land, we have witnessed and experienced great insecurity and fear, and we are still not done. Let's face this and not pretend that everything is crystal clear and that all our problems are short-lived. And I'm not only talking about the virus because we have more problems than that. Even if we managed to stay positive in the past year, we kept our faith in God and our hope for mankind. We've had to see how friends and relatives were petrified by the numbers of infections. Perhaps some of you have actually lost loved ones. There were those who behaved irresponsibly. Others became over-concerned or angry. Tensions, intolerance and patronization increased. For many, the development of vaccines could not go quickly enough. Others had great reservations. Even our governments soon entered a kind of survival mode from which they have yet to emerge. So I cannot make it any prettier than it has been, but I like to reflect with you today on where we go with our questions and with our insecurity, and maybe also with a surprising lack of questions. Perhaps there were questions we didn't even dare to ask. Could it be that some of us are looking in the wrong place for too much of our security? or that we are being seduced to adopt a worldview in which there is little room for God. Today I want to concentrate on the reading from Exodus. It's a very interesting reading because here we have the very start, the cradle of the temple service, of the worship of the people of Israel. But in order to truly understand it, we need to go back briefly to what happened immediately before, in chapter 32. You'll remember that there was this idol, a golden calf, which was made because the people had become impatient. Because Moses, who was meant to provide guidance and answers, was absent. It was all taking too long. 
It was getting sort of irresponsible, you know. Doesn't the leadership have anything to say about our suffering? You could hear them say. And I imagine they argued somewhat like this. What are the other nations doing? Shouldn't we do the same? Yes, but is there evidence that a golden calf will work? Someone retorted. No, not really, but surely even if it helps just a little bit, that would be worth it, right? Do you want to be responsible for not having tried everything? Everything in your power to alleviate the suffering of our people? Why hang on to that little bit of gold when you don't really need it anyway? Come on, it's a small sacrifice for a good purpose. The sooner you cooperate, the sooner we can all return to normal. And some added that this was even an excellent opportunity to do better than normal. And before they knew it, they all felt guilty when they did not hand in their gold. Even Aaron, representing the clergy, dared not oppose the misguided will of the people. Very few would have acknowledged they were betraying the God of their forefathers and their newly found liberty. For that, I think, was the real sacrifice that was made here. How easily a desire for freedom can lead to a new kind of slavery. So, how could they have missed that? Well, it must have been related to fear. So in that sense, you couldn't even blame them. When people think their survival is at stake, they switch to a different semi-automatic mode and become capable of the most incredible things, positive as well as negative. The sad thing is that people in this state believe they are rational and what they do is proportional and probably even long overdue. Something similar happened in Germany when the Nazi regime gained power. There was this great feeling of togetherness, of everyone working together for the prosperity of the nation. Nothing wrong with that, surely. Ordinary life was not even that much affected. But, hidden from sight, people and principles were crushed. Now, some modern thinkers believe we are in the early stages of a new era of dehumanization. Nowadays, how well a country is doing is measured by stock prices, not by the actual economy or how ordinary citizens are coping, let alone those in poorer countries. More and more countries and institutions have stopped genuinely listening to the voices of minorities. Thinking in terms of enemies, however, is on the rise. There's a growth of new rituals and do-it-yourself religions, many aimed at maximum happiness and security, mainly for the richer segment of the population. We too, we care a lot about our health and the health of our family and friends. That's only natural, but what about those who have almost nothing to eat, and even less due to the corona restrictions. I sometimes wonder how we manage to fool ourselves that we are all in this together, because there is so little tolerance for other opinions, and so little attention for other kinds of suffering. The Israelites were lucky that their golden calf got destroyed. The idols of our society are still standing. True, it was traumatic for the Israelites to lose their golden calf and to receive punishment, which, by the way, I believe to be a symbol of the inevitable disillusionment after we have trusted too much in our own capabilities and solutions. But at least they were able to make a fresh new start after that. And as we will see, any real new start is characterized by prayer. It's not characterized by more human pride. Of course, we must use our intelligence as well, but not before we have acknowledged our mistakes and perhaps our incorrect motivations as well. So first, at the end of chapter 32, we find Moses praying to God for forgiveness on behalf of the people. 
but there is no cheap grace and the people will have to repent. However, even before they do so, there are a few remarkable things that happen immediately. And first is that God instructs them to leave that place. Before they do anything else, they must distance. For them, the most social distancing meant to leave that place and the circumstances in which they had sinned. Repentance is more than confession or obsessing about your sins. It's a change of heart. It's picking up your things and moving in a new direction. And here is the next remarkable thing. God says, as if nothing has happened, go up to the land I promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. Go up to the land flowing with milk and honey. His promise still stood firm. God would send an angel before them to help them conquer the land. And this was later changed into a promise to accompany them with his own presence, that is to say, in person. And again, prayer, Moses speaking with God, played an important part in this. For what did Moses do? He used to pitch a tent at some distance from the camp, calling it the tent of meeting. Here is that word again, distance. Remember that this tent was the earliest precursor of a temple, a mobile tabernacle. Later on this tent would be in the middle of the camp, with the tribes camping around it. We read about that in the book of Numbers, chapter 2. Because in a theocracy, God lives, as it were, in the middle of the people. But at this stage, the relationship between God and the people still had to be restored. So they could not meet God in the center. I think it's sort of similar today, when contemporary society regards our faith in God as something strange and outlandish, it's perhaps better not to want to occupy center stage. Same thing with Jesus. When he came to this earth, he dwelt among us, but he was especially active in the margins of society, among the poor, the sick and the rejected. He was satisfied being part of a minority, minority of people surrounding John the Baptist, who called for repentance and announced the kingdom of God. Only much later would Christianity grow into a powerful movement, a central power within our culture. But perhaps in our time we are once again called to act as prophets in the margins of society, announcing a kingdom which is different from the new normal of the rich, who can easily survive lockdowns no matter how long they last. Perhaps we should mentally leave that place, the place where gigantic sums of money and technology are believed to usher in a new utopia. Perhaps we are called to go to those who are marginalized, ridiculed and impoverished and bring them a message of real hope, the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. This way, social distancing acquires a whole new meaning, doesn't it? Here we are, of course, talking about the more psychological and spiritual dimensions of distancing. That is to say, it's not healthy to remain locked up in that camp of fear, within a system that caused these problems in the first place. We are invited to go outside the camp, outside the trodden path, to face the deeper questions and to seek God's presence and His guidance. When we go through a desert period, as we are now, we are invited to go a little bit further into that desert. That may seem a little strange and dangerous at first, but then we discover that this is where God speaks to us. And not only that, but here he speaks to us like a friend. When I read this chapter again, I was struck by the order in which things happened. It was not so much God coming down from heaven with Moses then having to run towards the tent. Now anyone with a question would go to the tent. Moses would then go into the tent 
and only then a pillar of cloud which represented the glory of God would come down and they would speak. Amazing how God lets us take the initiative. When we turn to him in prayer, he will meet us where we are. This is after all how it would be with a friend. You don't have to make an appointment or gather so many signatures or bring a sacrifice first. Sacrifices were instituted later, after the Mosaic law was complete, and they were abolished again when Christ brought the final sacrifice for our sake. God and Moses speaking like friends. This may also remind us of the beloved disciple. The beloved disciple is mentioned six times in the Gospel of John causing the church fathers to believe that he was the Apostle John himself. So, we may ask, was there actually an Apostle who was more special than the others, so that he was known as the Beloved Apostle? Not necessarily. The expression does not appear in any other Gospel. If John was the author of the Gospel that bears his name, it may well be that all he was saying was, my relationship to Jesus was something special. But that does not necessarily indicate favoritism. When Peter asked, what about that one? Jesus answered that it was none of Peter's concern. He was to concentrate on following Jesus himself. So Jesus' relationship with other followers of his in no way interferes with our access to God. And that means that we are all treated as friends, as comrades, unconditionally. How wonderful to know this and to be able to act on it. But like Moses, we would do well to first leave the camp, that hectic place full of peer pressure and disinformation. We need to become silent again shake off our illusory certainties and open ourselves to what the Holy Spirit wants us to hear. And that may be different for each one of us, simply because we are all different and we have different needs. But I'm sure of one thing, our eyes will also be open to the needs of others, needs which are so often neglected or misrepresented in the newspapers and the speeches of the politicians, until it is too late. May God bless us with ears to hear, with true compassion, with strength to take up our cross in the new year, and may nothing distract us from his boundless love and Christ's peace. Amen.
So wherever we are on this Christmas tide, let us affirm our faith with Christians across the world, affirming our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven and was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. So wherever we are, let us bow our heads and let us now pray for the world, for the church, and for those in need. Let us pray. Almighty and loving Father, your Son was born at a dark time in history, when children were killed to ensure that a dictatorship would not fall. Two thousand years later, children are still vulnerable. Many are fugitives or suffer abuse and exploitation. Even as we speak, children are raised in fear or with bad role models. And yet into this kind of world came our light, which the darkness could not comprehend. Into this world came our dawn, which the darkness could not overcome. As we feel cast down these days, by the darkness, the failures and the idolatry in this world, help us to see the many good things which remain and which speak of your promise of hope through love. Lord, we ask you to bless our churches as they struggle through the lockdowns and closed borders. We pray especially for All Saints and its life groups which are restarting after Christmas as they pray, share, care and study. Lord, in this world which flows with milk and honey, we pray for those who go hungry. In this world with its palaces and temples of business, we pray for those with no proper affordable place to live. As we celebrate the creation of the Holy Family, we pray for all those who have no families or are estranged or separated from them. As we celebrate the birth of the Christ child, we pray for those who do not know him, for those who feel abandoned, excluded or without purpose in their lives, we pray that they may receive assurance that they are loved and wanted. As preparations are starting for a new Alpha course, Grant that this will yield fruitful encounters. Would you bless those who will be invited to respond? Lord, we pray for the neighborhoods in which we live. We pray that ever new initiatives to reach out may be embraced, not fearing it may unsettle our established way of doing things. Help us to encourage input from young and old, regulars and passers-by. Open us up to our own and each other's talents and gifts. Grant us mutual trust, tolerance and cooperation. Lord, this is a time of spiritual darkness for some and emotional depth for others. It's a time of illness amongst many and desperation amongst some. We pray for all those who are suffering at this time, physically or psychologically 
and for those around them who attempt to care. We pray for overworked medical staff and for anxious owners and employees of small businesses. Into the darkness of all these people, O Lord, we ask you to send your Spirit, to comfort and to guide in the way of truth and peace. Finally, we are grateful for the promise in your word that a new heaven and a new earth will come, not of our making, but by your mercy and strength. And so we pray, Maranatha, Lord, come again. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. So we come to our closing prayers. First prayer is our offering to God afresh, our giving unto him. Generous God, creator, redeemer, sustainer. To you we present our financial offerings, symbol of the work you've given us to do. Use it, use us, in the service of your world, to the glory of your name. Amen. Merciful Lord, can cast your bright beams of light upon all saints and upon the church in this world, that, being enlightened by the teaching of your blessed Apostle and Evangelist St. John, we may so walk in the light of your truth, that we may at last attain to the light of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, your incarnate Son, our Lord. Amen. Merciful God, Teach us to be faithful in change and uncertainty, that trusting in your word and obeying your will, we may enter the unfailing joy of Jesus Christ, our Lord. In the name of your Son. Amen. And a prayer as our new year approaches. O God, by whose command the order of time runs its course, forgive our impatience, perfect our faith, and while we wait for the fulfilment of your promises, grant us to have a good hope because of your word. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So rejoicing in the presence of God here among us, we pray as our Saviour taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. come now to our announcements or church notices. Uh, two notices. Firstly, about our prayer ministry team. With all the changes with Corona, the suspension of our services, our prayer ministry team, however, remain willing and available to pray with you uh, online. If you'd like them to pray with you, uh, please uh, text or particularly WhatsApp uh, Ron Vesterbeek, and he will arrange uh, two team members who can pray with you in a suitable time uh, through on, online. This is not necessarily for uh, significant issues only. It can be just that this week has been hard and you would really enjoy people to pray with you at this time. So the Prayer Minister team with, Pro, uh, with Ron Vesterbeck are very happy to pray with yourselves. Secondly about Alpha. Our Alpha will begin on no uh, Monday the, the 11th of January. And I wanted to invite each of you uh, watching to be part of Preparing for Alpha to consider whom we can invite. And I wanted to invite each member of All Saints and each person who joins us in our worship today to pray a simple prayer today and in the coming week. Lord, is there someone you would like me to invite to Alpha? If a name comes to mind, is laid on your heart, reach out to that person and invite them. We're simply being obedient to the name we think God may have laid on our heart. The response of the person is left with God. Our role is simply to make the offer, the invitation, to make them aware, even simply. 
But as we invite and whatever or however they respond, perhaps other conversations might be sparked between our friend and ourselves. So we now come to our final carol, Shall We Sing Together? So wherever we are, let's now receive uh, God's blessing afresh. May the joy of the angels, the eagerness of the shepherds, the perseverance of the wise men, the obedience of Joseph and Mary and the peace of Christ be yours this Christmas tide, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you now and forevermore. Amen. Let's close by praying together the words of the grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all this day and forevermore. Amen.